Hello everyone and welcome to episode 16 of the Power of Books. My name is Timo Jübner, I'm the founder of Timo's Notes and in this show I interview popular non-fiction authors about their best-selling books. The goal of the show is to introduce you to new books and to provide you with actionable advice and tools to live a better life. My guest today is Ethan Cross. Ethan is one of the world's leading experts on controlling the conscious mind. An award-winning professor in the University of Michigan's top-ranked psychology department and its Ross School of Business, he's the director of the Emotion and Self-Control Laboratory. In his book Chatter, Ethan explains the voice in our head and shares some tools we can use to take control of negative self-talk and harness our inner voice. From our conversation today, you can expect to learn why having an inner voice is totally normal and what functions it serves, how you can handle chatter in performance situations, what we can do to support people around us struggling with chatter, and a lot more. So now let's get right into our conversation. Enjoy the show. Ethan Cross, welcome to the Power of Books podcast. I'm happy to have you on today and talk about your book, Chatter. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Me too. I'm excited. Your book was actually published almost two years ago, right? In January That's 2021. Right. And I yep. guess a lot has happened since then. Yeah, it's been, uh, it, it, it's funny. Uh, two years goes by really fast. And um, there's been a lot of talking about chatter from, <laughs> I've been talking a lot about, about it a lot, which has been a lot of fun. And just seeing people, you know, how they react to it has been, um, uh, uh, interesting and gratifying experience when you work on a book for as long as I did, which was more years than I'd like to admit. And um, uh, it's just nice to to see it get out there in the world. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. And, and the, to, to get kind of into the book, it's based on your studies and research in psychology. You're a professor at University of Michigan. And I'm, I'm really interested like what inspired you to get into this field uh, and eventually also write the book uh, that we're going to talk about today? Well, I've, I, it turns out I've long been interested in psychology and in particular um, the topic of introspection about what happens when we turn our attention inward to try to make sense of our experiences in this wacky world in which we live. Um, the the root of that experience goes way back to about the time I was three three or so years old. Uh, one of the first memories I have is my dad telling me over and over whenever I experience some problem to quote unquote go inside and try to find the answer myself. Um, so he was prompting me to introspect from a very young age. And back then, when he used to give me that instruction, I really, quite frankly, um, thought he was being annoying, <laughs> and I would roll my eyes and complain to my mother. But but as a parent now, I find it really interesting how the things parents say to their kids, even when their kids pretend that they're being annoying, their parents are being annoying and they pretend not to listen, they somehow have a way of working their way into our consciousnesses. And, um, and it did work its way into mine. And so throughout my childhood and adolescence, whenever I'd encounter a problem, I, I'd pause, I'd try to make sense of, well, why, why did this happen? What does this mean? How can I move on? And I, I was always really good at problem solving in that way. I never really got stuck ruminating or worrying about something excessively when I was a kid or adolescent. Um, and so it was a real uh, asset that I, I felt that I had. And then I went to college and perhaps not surprisingly decided to major in psychology. And um, when I took my first psychology class, about halfway through the semester, we got to this topic of introspection. And as, uh, I don't know, um, as an overly confident undergraduate, I thought to myself, I don't need to read this stuff. Like <laughs> I, I've been doing this back for a while. Like sit down professor, I will tell you how this works. Like that was my inner monologue. And um, what I very quickly learned was that I was totally, totally wrong. Because when we dug into the science of introspection, what 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 I learned was on the one hand, for a lot of the a lot of people, a lot of the time, this ability to reflect on our lives, this ability to introspect, this was a superpower that human beings possess. 
This is the tool that allows us to do things like build spaceships that blast us into outer space and develop vaccines and all sorts of innovation. It allows us to problem solve and simulate. But for a lot, a lot of other people, this capacity is a source of enormous suffering because we deal with, we experience something negative in our lives. We try to make sense of it, but we don't end up succeeding. We end up getting stuck in these negative thought loops that have a way of making our lives miserable. So we ruminate about the past and we worry about the present and future, and that leads to a cascade of negative outcomes. And so, um, so why that happens, why introspection sometimes helps us and other times harms us, this to me ended up becoming a remarkably interesting question. And I became super passionate about trying to answer it. And so I went to graduate school to learn how to use the tools of of psychology and neuroscience to do exactly that, to understand this self-reflection paradox, and perhaps most importantly, uh, identify tools that people can use to manage introspection more effectively. About 15 years ago, I moved to the University of Michigan, set up a lab, and we've been doing research on that ever since. That's such a cool story. And, and I think it's always great when people kind of follow something that they've they were interested in from a very young age and then kind of it's their path and they just follow it and it keeps like getting them interested and keeps like the passion alive so i always like that that's so cool and yeah uh, it makes work fun that's for sure right and it's funny how you first thought you knew everything about this and now you spent years of your work life, like researching about the topic to understand it even better. <laughs> so That's that shows right. us that we never really know too much about anything, right? Well, I think, you know, um, the longer you're in science, uh, and that is probably true of most disciplines, the more you realize how, how little we know. Um, like working on chatter actually was, was a really, well, it was equal parts fun and stressful. We could talk about both if you want, but part of the really fun and exciting part about working on Chatter is, yes, I got to talk about research from my own lab, but I also was able to go really far astray and look at the field of various fields, science, psychology, um, anthropology, neuroscience, and so forth. And on the one hand, you, you realize very quickly, we've actually learned quite a bit about these topics that I was researching. But you also realize that we've learned a lot, but there is way more that we need to learn. So um, so there's been enormous progress on the one hand, and I think that's really exciting and affirming. But um, th there's just – there's such – so much undiscovered territory that we need to explore. And I think that too is really exciting for the next generation of, of folks who want to participate in that endeavor. Totally, yeah. And I'm going to try to push the edge a little to find out what we know and what we don't know yet uh, in, in science about this. Sure. So I want, to, I want to start in with, like, is there a scientific answer kind of, like, why do we even have an inner voice? Why do we talk to ourselves in our own head? Yes, there is. And I think, it, I think this is a really important starting point for the conversation. Um, Because a lot of people, when they think about their inner voice, they think about the suffering that it causes. In fact, the question I get most often is, hey, Dr. Cross, how, how, do I get, how do I get rid of this inner voice? Just shut it up. It's so goddamn annoying. And what I like to remind people of is the fact that your inner voice is this remarkable tool that we all possess. And I like to think of it as a Swiss army knife of the human mind. It's a tool that serves many different functions. Just to give you a couple of examples of what some of the key um, functions it provides are, at the most basic end of the spectrum, your inner voice is part of what we call our verbal working memory system. This is a very basic system of the human mind that lets you keep information active for short periods of time, verbal information specifically. So if I were to ask you to, um, well, what's your favorite sports team, Timo? Uh, it's the Los Angeles Lakers, actually. Oh, Okay. Um, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the, what are the, what is the like phrase that you say for the Lakers? Oh, I don't even go know. Laker. Yeah, okay, probably go Lakers. Yeah. Go Lakers. Okay. If I were to ask you to repeat in your head three times, go Lakers. Could you do it? Silently. Probably. Yeah. No, well do it right now. 
All right. Did you do it? Yeah, I, I kind of, I, I think I started, but then I drifted off immediately, basically. Then you stopped. Okay, <laughs> but you were able to do it at least once, right? Sure, yeah. Yeah, well, um, that's good. Your brain is functioning properly. Um, basically, this is a core feature of the, the human mind, this, this ability to re rehearse verbal information and keep it active for a short period. This is this, a system, your, and your inner voice explains how it works, that lets you go to the grocery store and think to yourself, oh, what was I supposed to get when you can't remember what was on your list? And you repeat, eggs, cheese, yogurt, right? That's your inner voice. So super basic function. It let, your inner voice lets you keep verbal information active for short moments in time. It also lets you simulate and plan. So before I go and give presentations, I will often uh, take a walk around the hotel lobby or neighborhood and I'll go over in my head what I'm going to say. And I'll often do this word for word. I'll go through the entire speech. I'm not doing this out loud. I'm doing it in my head. And then when I get to the end of the speech, I imagine what someone else, what question are they going to ask me? And usually the questions they ask me in that simulation that I'm performing, they're really obnoxious, right? They're, they're the worst possible question. And I hear it and then I respond. Sometimes I respond by like leaping across the stage in my mind, and, you know. But but the idea here is I'm using my inner voice to simulate and plan. It's another reason we do it. Before presentations, dates, interviews, people often report activating their inner voice for that for that function. Uh, exercising, let's talk about that, performance. Many people report coaching themselves along, sometimes critiquing, but often coaching themselves when they're exercising. So mm -hmm. when I'm doing an intense exercise class, I'm constantly talking to myself. I'm counting down the number of reps that are left in a set, nine, eight, seven. I am, when if I'm on the treadmill and I'm tired and I need to make a goal, I'm saying, come on, man, you got three more, three more you know, miles to go. You got this. I'm doing that in my head. Sometimes I am whispering very unkind expletives at the coach who is telling me to do painful things. Right, they're telling me to do something. I'm like, you son of a right? All <laughs> happening in here. Right, that's my inner voice coaching me along. And then the last, the last function I would mention is your inner voice. It it um, it helps you tell stories, and uh, the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and our role in this world. Those stories are really powerful because they shape our understanding of our identity and who we are. So when things don't work out, like we expect them to. We often pause, try to figure out why, why Why didn't I get this job? Why did this report not work out the way it was supposed to? And then we come up with a narrative. Well, you know, I was under the weather and this person wasn't so nice and it's all okay. Like your inner voice is helping you create those narratives that capture really the essence of who we are. So in terms of what your inner voice does for you, keeping information active, storytelling, simulating, coaching, you would not want to live life without this inner voice. The problem, of course, is that this tool that we all possess, which is so useful, sometimes, as I'm sure most listeners have experienced, sometimes it jams up on us, right? We, we are experiencing some adversity and we want to use this tool to work through it, but it jams up. We get stuck. Why did this happen? Oh my God, I don't know. What does this mean? Oh my God, what if this happens and then this and then this? And we start spinning. That's that sort of spinning in our minds is what I call chatter. And I think it's one of the great problems we face as a species. I think it is incredibly common and it can cause, um, cause a massive amount of suffering, um, can undermine our ability to think and perform, create friction in our relationships and damage our health. And so uh, that's why I've devoted so much of my professional life to understanding what tools are out there that people can use to manage it. Mm, right. And that's so interesting, like all these functions that the inner voice has. So thank you for laying these out for the audience. So you just mentioned that, if I got it right, chatter is only the negative thoughts that you keep repeating to yourself, right? That's, that's right. It's one thing of the inner voice. But do we understand from a neurological viewpoint like what's going on in the brain why we keep like saying the same things and like going down that rabbit hole of negative thoughts well it's hard to pinpoint um where exactly the six regions are that play a role in chatter because 
chatter can manifest itself differently. And the brain is an amazingly complex organ that has so much specificity. And so, you know, we don't want to oversimplify the role that the brain is playing in this. Like chatter about trauma can be different about than chatter about um, what your next vacation is going to, whether it's going to be, you know, productive. There are, though, some commonalities that cut across different kinds of chatter experiences. And we do see heightened levels of activation in a group of brain regions in a, or in a network that are involved in, in what we call self-referential processing or thinking about the self. This is going to be gory, but let's say you were to take a chainsaw, right? Rev it up and just bzzz, like cut me straight down the middle. And so if you're like, you know, go from my forehead straight through my nose, over the mouth, just cut my face in half, split me open, your cortical midline would be right in the middle of your brain. There's a strip that wraps around your brain and that cortical midline tends to be more active when people are thinking about their lives and the content of their lives, um, the things that have happened to them. And so we see that that self-referential network more active when people are experiencing chatter than when they're thinking about experiences more productively. Interesting. Yeah. But I mean, I'm not a, a neuroscience expert or anything. I know some of the brain regions, but it's sure. interesting to hear like where this takes place and those yeah. are very interesting. And there's still, to be clear, a lot of hunting that we need to do, you know, um, the, the, Brain research linking social and emotional experiences to patterns of neural activity is still incredibly young. Um, you know, I would say it has started in earnest only about 20, 20 years ago, if that. And one of the things that is happening is the methodologies we have to understand how the brain works every every few months are improving and we're learning more. And so uh, it's a really cool area of work to be spending some time in yeah i can imagine as you said it's so exciting because there's so much still to explore right yeah so one thing you also talk about in the book is that there's there are two different types of attention there's voluntary attention and involuntary attention and one problem is like as most of us know who we probably practice sports or like an instrument or something like that is that if we are getting good at a certain point it's kind of getting involuntary so we're kind of in sports it's muscle memory right if you throw a basketball or a pitch baseball you kind of know what you're doing without actually thinking about it but then the problem is when when chatter kicks in you start thinking too much about something that you shouldn't think about right so yep. so how can for example athletes or people performing on on a stage with a, like a musical performance or something like that how could people really handle that situation when it's happening? Well, the first thing to know is that there's no one magic cure-all for all people in all situations. And I think this should be a source of hope and inspiration rather than despair. And what I mean by this is there are lots of different tools, science-based tools that people can use to manage those um, kinds of experiences. When we're talking about athletes executing in the moment, what we really do want to get them to be in a point of having like a quiet mind. We don't want the inner voice really active. We want to just let them go on autopilot and execute the behaviors that they've learned to do without thinking. That can sometimes be challenging to do because of the stress involved in those kinds of um, events or, or performances. One tool that many athletes find very useful are, are rituals. So I, I like to call rituals a kind of ancient chatter fighting tool because they've been around for a long time and have really proven the test of time and more recently the test of science. There's data showing that they can be useful. What a ritual is, is a rigid sequence of behaviors that is infused with meaning. So what I mean by that is take a basketball player. A basketball player might get up to the free throw line and before um, shooting their, their hoop, they may like tug at their shorts Uh, you know, like bounce the ball a few times, wipe their brow. They're doing things in a very rigid, sequenced way that don't necessarily speak to their goal that they have of sinking the, the, the bucket, right? Like it's not clear why 
a basketball player has to bounce the ball four times before shooting. How is bouncing the ball four times actually going to help them get the ball in the bucket? That's not what a ritual is doing. What a ritual is doing is it's giving people something to do that is under their control. When we're experiencing chatter, we often feel like we don't have control. Oh my God, what if this doesn't work out the way I expect it to, to, to work out? And that can be really unsettling because human beings as a rule are control freaks. We love to know that the world is predictable and controllable. We love to know that it's predictable and controllable because that makes it easier to navigate this world. Like, think about what would it be like if you were to leave your house and not know if you get shot or not? What would it be like to, to walk down the street and not know if a car would veer off the road onto the sidewalk and hit you? That would be a really hard world to navigate. And in mm -hmm. some parts of the world, that is the way the world is. And those parts of the world are filled with people experiencing more chatter. So, so what rituals do for us is when we're experiencing a lack of control in our lives, we're not doing something that is under our control. And when we do something that is under our control, we perform that ritual. That leads to this phenomenon of compensatory control. So this is giving this, us this feeling that, hey, we're in control of things. And that compensates for the lack of control we feel outside that specific instance. So that's one of the ways that rituals can help us. This is also the reason why, um, by the way, so many people clean and organize when they're experiencing chatter. It's very common when people are stressed out to they put everything away. I do this myself, um, which is very out of character for me. I'm a pretty... Uh, how can I say this? Um, uh, fly by the seat of your pants kind of guy in the sense that when things are going well, like their papers all over the place and clothing on the floor it drives my wife crazy, but I don't mind. Like I've got to, uh, whatever. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> when I'm experiencing chatter, I put everything away nice and neat. And actually before working in this area, I wasn't really sure why I did that. Um, turns out there's research which speaks to this and it's a similar principle, right? You're creating order in the world when you lack it inside your head. And, um, and that can be helpful. Mm. Totally. I mean, when I play basketball, or I used to play tennis and then before I surf, I had a ritual and, and every athlete that I know, like people I played with and also professionals, you know, everybody, as you said, has a certain yeah. ritual for sequences like that. So that's really interesting. And it kind of quiets the mind, as you said, gives us the sense of control that we don't actually have. But that's so cool to understand it from, from a scientific uh, perspective. Yeah. Now to, sorry, did you want to add something? Well, only that I, I find it interesting because I think rituals get a bad rap in popular culture because they're often mm -hmm. um, equated with uh, mental mental disorders like various kinds of anxiety conditions, um, which is not to say that you can't take a ritual to an extreme. You can. You can take any tool to an extreme. What I like to remind people of is a hammer as a physical tool can be the source of beauty and innovation, right? Like I have a high live in a house. It was built with a hammer. I mean, and other tools, but like hammer was really useful, but a hammer can be like a murder weapon, right? In the wrong hands, or it can destroy a house too. So you want to figure out how to wield these tools effectively. And um, so just, there was just another little add on rituals can be taken to an extreme, but when implemented in the right proportions, really, really useful. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Now to, to take a little step back from like going back from performance situations to like everyday life, you also share in the book that we as humans, we have a, a certain urge to share when we experience chatter, we want to share yeah. it with other people. And like you, you briefly mentioned the role social media plays in this, because nowadays everybody, you know, we can just type in what we think and we can kind of give our negative inner voice a voice outside in the outside world. So what do you think like is social media in that regard, like an inherently bad tool or do you think it also has benefits that we're able to share our thoughts like that? 
Well, you know, I've, I've been do, we we have been doing research on social media and its implications for well being for um, close to fifteen years now. And my take on social media is it's a technology that can be useful or unhelpful depending on how you use it. Um, social media provides us with a new environment to engage in social interactions, and environments tend not to be good or bad for us, whether they're good or bad for us depends on how we engage in those environments. So to, you know, you draw the analogy here, I can um, leave my house and go to a specific neighborhood and talk to people who live there in the wrong way and get in big trouble, or go to a different neighborhood and talk differently and benefit. Um, What's interesting about social media is we don't really get, because it's so new, our parents haven't necessarily taught us how to engage with social media. Hey, these are the things you should do or not do, right? Like we're still learning about those tactics. And so I think what we see happening is some people end up using social media in ways that can be damaging and can promote chatter. And there's no question that it can play a role in chatter. Um, We know that people, as you mentioned, are very motivated to share their chatter when they experience it. And in the offline world, there are often obstacles to sharing what's going through your head because you've got to find someone who's willing to listen to you. And like right now, I'm sitting in my office. There's no one else here. If I go down, I, I don't know where anyone is. I don't know if I can find someone who I'm actually comfortable enough to reveal what's going on in my head. I may have to wait a couple of hours till I find someone. And guess what? While I'm waiting for someone to talk to about my chatter, my chatter's changing because time usually heals that chatter, takes the edge off, right? Time does heal. And so maybe three or four hours from now, when I find a friend or my wife or daughters to talk about, like, not a big deal anymore. Now let's change the equation, right? Like, I've just experienced some chatter. Here's the smartphone, right? Like, it takes me about three seconds, maybe less, to log in, go on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. And I'm just staring at a screen now that says, what's on your mind? And I'm not looking back at someone having to think, oh, well, what are they going to think of me if I say this? I could just type into that screen whatever is bothering me. And and so social media makes it really easy for us to share. It also, because there's no human being looking back at us on the other side of that prompt, no other human being like giving us information from the way their faces look when we talk that maybe say, hey, maybe you shouldn't say it that way. We can be relatively uninhibited. And um, I think if we look around, there are lots of examples of how this process can lead to things like cyberbullying, trolling, shaming, uh, which can have really negative consequences both for the poster as well as the person on the other side of the, the equation. It can lead to virality of of chatter and, and chatter spikes in that regard too. So that's the dark side of social media. I do want to emphasize though that there is research showing that social media can also be really valuable in the sense of providing people with opportunities to seek out, to ask for help and to receive it. And so um, it really is about how you utilize that technology. And I think the the challenge we face now is really sharing our understanding about the dynamics that explain how social media works, like teaching our kids about it so that they can use that technology more strategically. Yeah, I totally agree. So it's, it's kind of like the filter of like, what is the other person going to think if I say this is removed if you just type it in, if you don't totally kind of question yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, people say things, I mean, to others on social media that they would never dream of saying to them, right. to their face. And um, I think it's important to remind ourselves of that. Totally right. Yeah. So um, if if someone comes to us in, in real life, you know, if it's a friend, as you mentioned, or a family member, husband, wife, daughter, son, whatever, and we, we have a sense that, you know, they are in this negative thought loop, but they don't open up to us, but we kind of want to help. You mentioned a few tools that we can use to assist or respond to the, the chatter that we sense in someone else without being like offensive or anything. What are those tools? Yeah, so here we're talking about um, a type of support that we call invisible support. And and the reason to, to do this is um, sometimes we see other people in our lives that are suffering from chatter, but they haven't asked us for help. 
And if you volunteer the help in those instances, they can get defensive. And this is a common experience I think many listeners have probably had. You know, think back to a time when your parents may have volunteered advice about how you should live your life. Like, often it comes from a really well intentioned place, but you haven't asked for it. And so the way you interpret this is do you not think I'm capable of handling my own shit? If you did, why would you be saying that? And so defensiveness, not good for relationships. The, the good news is that there are still ways that you can help other people who are suffering from chatter when they haven't asked you for help. We call it invisible support. And what it involves doing is getting people resources without drawing attention to the fact that you're doing it. And there are many different forms this invisible support can take from relatively simple to more complex. A couple of examples. Let's say my my team, my lab is really str- they're they're stressed out, chatter, chatter, chatter with a deadline, um, and they also have to do like beyond submitting the paper or proposals we're working on. They've got to do other things like get food. And, you know, I could do simple things like um, take care of dinner and coffee for the day, whatever, so they don't have to think about this. Or if my wife is experiencing chatter and she's got a bunch of responsibilities on her plate that day. I can take, I can do those things for her. I can get the groceries and the dry cleaning and the take care of dinner, right? If it was her turn to do that, I'm doing those things to just ease her burden, make it easier for her to deal with the stuff that she has on her plate. I'm importantly not doing those things. And then at the end of the day, showing her a receipt, Hey, look at all the things I've done for you. Can I have a pat on the back? It's not how this works. You're just doing things to make that other person's life a little bit easier so they can manage the chatter more effectively. Uh, Another way of helping invisibly is if there's a particular skill or problem that a person is struggling with that you think you have an answer to, try to get them the information indirectly. So let's say someone in my group is struggling with their presentation skills. Rather than pulling them aside, say, hey, I've noticed you can improve in a few different ways. Here are some suggestions, which could be a blow to their ego. We might have a meeting, a group meeting, which we share out common difficulties and solutions that we've encountered in this public speaking context. So I'm getting the person the information they need, but it's part of a group endeavor. I'm not shining a spotlight that they don't, that they are the one who is not performing. Last, last tool for invisible support I'll flag is something that I call it, um, affectionate but not creepy touch. So what I mean by this is uh, in the right context, when it's mutually desired, an affectionate embrace, uh, uh, you know, a pat on the back, a caress, a handhold, a fist pump, uh, that can be a powerful tool for helping people with chatter as well. One of the things we know about affectionate touch is, A, it's arguably one of the most primitive tools we have for regulating other people's emotions that we're aware of. So the moment a baby is born into this world, what do we do with that baby? We put it on its mother's chest, skin to skin contact. We know from research that when you initiate that affectionate embrace, and there are ways in which your body is designed to code an affectionate embrace specifically, that that leads to this release of stress fighting chemicals virtually automatically that help us feel better. And it also reminds us at a conscious level that there's someone else out there who actually cares about us. And that also feels good. Well, yeah, I really like the point about invisibly providing some someone with the resources or skills that they need. Like this also applies to work life. You know, if you have a colleague that you don't want to openly, as you said, give feedback about some something he's lacking, just call a group meeting. As as you as you explained, that's a yeah, great tool exactly. to use for work life as well. I love that. Yeah. Now, one more thing that I I want to get into because I thought it was so fascinating is that you also did a study about how placebos affect chatter and like what you found out really blew my mind. So so what did you find out? Well, what we find, and and this is representative more generally of, of the field of placebo research, is that how you think about something can really make a difference in in. Um, how you feel. And so in one study, we recruited people who had experienced emotional heartbreak. They had just been dumped by someone else. And we had them think about that experience of being dumped um, under different conditions. In one condition, we gave people uh, essentially a placebo. And we said to them, um, 
this is going to provide you with emotional relief. Um, it's like a painkiller in, um, uh, in spray form. We have them inhale this placebo nasal spray. Uh, instantly passes the blood-brain barrier and, and, and you know, blunts your emotional reaction. And then after we had them do this, we had them look at the pictures of the person who dumped them and, and think about how they felt when they were dumped. And then in another condition, we gave people the same spray, but we told them, this is just a spray to clean your nasal passages and help our equipment work better. We didn't give them a story that said that these this spray is actually going to help. In both conditions, the spray was benign. It was a saline solution. But what we find is that the people who thought that they were taking a drug, they actually felt much, much better about the breakup than the people who thought they were taking the nasal spray, the saline spray. And so the take home here is that how we think about our circumstances can very, very powerfully impact the way we feel. And I think that's a really important um, take home to be aware of. And it's certainly you know, placebos specifically, like they can have real value. So, you know, if that bracelet or lucky charm, if that, uh, if, you know, if you think that's going to help you get a better grade and perform more effectively, the research suggests you should probably keep wearing it because the, the costs of not doing so are quite minimal and the upshot is, is pretty high. Yeah, as I said, this this section totally blew my mind. So it just showed me like the power of our mind. It's it's crazy. But one thing I was wondering about: does this effect has have to be anchored in something physical, like a pill, or like as you said, a bracelet, or like how does that work? Yeah, that's a um, that's a great um, great question. So there is some data showing that having an actual cue can potentiate these effects, can increase them because it gives us something concrete to latch onto. There's even research that has gone further to look at whether the, like the color of, of the pills make a difference. And I think things break down a little bit after that, but, but there's definitely some evidence that um, the, the, the object itself can play a role because we we form these conditioned associations to those objects so pills for example we tend to learn because most of the time you take a pill to deal with a problem and the pill helps mm. you make an association in your mind if i take this pill then i will feel better and that's one pathway through which um, a placebo can modify your expectations through that automatic pathway there's also of course a more conscious pathway through which this works in which you know, someone that you trust tells you, you're going to feel better, trust me. And then you repeat that in your head and you come to believe it. But both of those mechanisms help explain how placebos work. Mm, right. But, um, I think it makes sense. And if I get it right, you could also have like a, a mental thought pattern, you know, that when you realize chatter, for example, then you have certain steps that you follow mentally to kind of get to the positive effect right it just the important thing is that it's kind of a, a habit or a ritual again that you uh, connect with the positive effect yeah and i think well you know for the for the for chatter you mean now yes yeah i think for chatter you know here's the take home the take home is a i think it's really important to understand what chatter is just understanding mm. that this is a normal feature of the human condition i think is in and of itself really important and empowering um, number two recognizing that there are lots of different tools that are out there to use this is this is important because i think what it gives people the opportunity to do is number one we recognize when the chatter has struck and then when it does strike come up with a plan to try these different tools to make it get better. So I've got a plan. Like people ask me, you study chatter, do you ever experience it? Sometimes, but I'm really good at those chatter reactions being pretty narrow and not long because the moment it strikes, I have two or three things that I do instantly. And if those two and three things don't work, usually they do, but if they don't, I layer on another three or four tools. Mm -hmm. So I've got a game plan. I don't have to wait and just stumble through life waiting for the chatter to subside and i i think that's a huge advantage that um that i've got in my back pocket and the hope is that the book can give that to anyone else who reads it 
It totally does, yes. You said being aware of when it kicks in and then using one of the tools you talk about in the book or today on the show, right? So to, to wrap it up, I want to ask you one question that I ask everything. And since the show is called The Power of Books and you have such a beautiful shelf behind you, I want to ask you, like, what are some of the most impactful books that you've read? Maybe mention one or two. Okay, I'll give you an old one and a new one. How's that? Um, That's great. The old one is a book I read almost every year and have for several decades now. It's called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. It's a story of a, of a, um, a person who had everything taken away during World War II, lost his family, and ended up becoming being able to thrive and survive. And he wrote a book that illustrates how he was able to do it. And so really, it's, I think it's a testament to the power of the human condition. Um, so I assign that to all my classes, and every time I do, I read it again. Um, very powerful book. Um, sometimes I find um, real value not just in nonfiction, but in fiction as well. And I think uh, there are a lot of fiction authors who have just this amazing capacity to capture human nature. And um, and I recently read a book called Tomorrow, 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 which was a pretty um, pretty remarkable a way of describing loving relationships between friends and how that can change um, as they go through their lives and experience both victories and defeats. Um, so that's another book I'd recommend. Awesome. I haven't heard of the second one, but I've heard of, of Man's Search for Meaning. I haven't read both yeah. of them yet. The second but... one is relatively recent. It came out this year. It's gotten a bunch of awards. It's a, it's a really phenomenal read. Highly recommend it. Awesome. I'm going to check it out then right thank you for these recommendations uh for the listeners what's the best place to get like uh, follow you get content from you or learn more about what you do uh best place is my website www.ethancross with a k k r o s s dot com links there to the book downloads social media and uh, my lab and everything else you can like or want Awesome. I'll link that in the show notes for the listeners. Well, Ethan, thank you so much for taking the time. It was so interesting and, and yeah, it's a fascinating topic and I'm glad that you took the time today to talk to me about it and thank you for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. Good luck with the show. Thank you to all the listeners. Check out the book to learn more about what we talked about today to get the tools and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. All right, that's it. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please leave us a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the show to never miss a new episode. Also, check out our YouTube channel if you prefer video podcasts. All right, guys, I'll see you next week. Have a great day. Bye-bye.